The First World War was the most terrible conflict the world had known up to that point, and in Britain every community of any size had lost men in action. If you visit even the smallest British town or village, undoubtedly a memorial stands to the human tragedy of World War I, often appended with the names of those who fell in the Second World War as well. Following the November 1918 armistice, a process began of dismantling the German war machine and demobilising most of her troops. The Entente powers that had fought the Germans took possession of a staggering amount of equipment. An idea formed that German artillery guns in particular would make excellent war trophies to be distributed among the victorious powers, and they would be sent to cities, towns and villages the length and breadth of the British Isles to act as additional war memorials to remember the sacrifices of local men in the Great War. Artillery guns make for excellent memorials. They are imposing, evocative and solidly built, able to withstand the weather for decades. Using captured guns as war trophies was not new. Many British towns had Napoleonic or Crimean War era captured guns on display, so there was a definite precedent to the plan. The only problem with the new plan was a profound war weariness among veterans and civilians generally. World War I had been a slaughter on an industrial scale, and in the immediate post-war period the wounds of war were fresh, with hardly a family unaffected. By July 1919, the War Trophies Committee had 2,500 German artillery guns in storage in the UK, rising to 3,595 by April 1920. In addition, the committee would distribute 15,000 German machine guns, 75,000 small arms and sundry other trophies all over the UK. Some of these weapons were claimed by regimental museums, but most were offered to towns and villages in Britain and across the Commonwealth. Spaces were found to display the guns, memorial plaques cast, and military and religious services of commemoration performed. It seemed that most of the towns and villages that were offered these weapons demanded a German field gun for display. A few towns held off, worried about adding to the grief of parents and widows by displaying German weapons. Some councils went ahead despite local opposition, in many cases very strong and vocal opposition. This led to protests and often direct action by locals against the hazed guns. There were many reports of groups of veterans, often drunk, hauling the guns from their display areas and pushing them into rivers, village ponds or off cliffs. The feeling was that the kinds of men who had sat on councils during the war were the ones who had done well out of the war, while most of the local men had gone to war and many had not returned. The local landed gentry and former army officers often tried to persuade locals that having trophy guns was a fine tradition, as indeed it was, but many had to transfer the guns to their private estates or to military museums to keep them from being tipped into rivers. Of course, many guns were also accepted by locals, and if not particularly liked, were nonetheless tolerated in their communities, and as time began to heal the raw wounds of the war, these guns became important symbols of commemoration. Australia received 700 trophy guns and New Zealand 200, while Canada received well over a thousand for display. The next threat to the surviving guns in Britain was health and safety, which is not a modern concern, but one that actually started back in the early 1930s. The German guns naturally had become the playthings of children, who had a disconcerting habit of falling off the guns and injuring themselves. Many of the guns were scrapped by local councils in an effort to resolve this issue. With the introduction of the 1937 Firearms Act in the UK, the trophy guns were legally defined as firearms and required deactivation or scrapping. The only people who could legally do this were registered firearms dealers. Most didn't want to take on the job, so the War Office was forced to remove many of the guns themselves. And then came World War II. If you walk through any of Britain's Victorian or Edwardian residential areas today, you'll notice front garden walls that have rows of metal stumps embedded in them. This is the result of World War II scrap metal drives, when iron railings were cut down for recycling and never replaced. 
Many of the German trophy guns were targeted for scrapping under this scheme. They were, after all, German. In Canada, for example, 1,400 German World War I guns were melted down in 1942. This is why today so few World War I German trophy guns remain in Britain and the Commonwealth. When I initially became interested in this subject, I naively thought that there would be loads of these guns all over the place, right across the UK. But in the east of England where I live, in a total of four different counties, I could only find one that was still on public display, and most importantly displayed not in a museum. I've catalogued as best I can all of the German trophy guns that still exist in Britain today. They are not museum guns, which I've excluded from the list, but are all displayed in public spaces and are accessible free of charge. It is a short list, but among them are many different types of German gun. All of these guns are now treasured by local communities and form the centrepieces of memorials to the World War I and II dead. As I mentioned, in eastern England, only one remains today, the tiny village of Honing, just outside of Norwich, where I live in Norfolk. This peculiar-looking weapon isn't strictly an artillery gun, but rather is a Minenwerfer, a type of mortar. The Honing example was manufactured in 1917. It fired a large shell and was very effective against enemy emplacements, pillboxes and other fortifications. The weapon weighs around three quarters of a ton. This particular Minenwerfer was probably given to the village at war's end to help remember the 17 local men who were killed in World War I. It stood outside the village post office until 1970, when the local landowner and World War I veteran, Colonel Reginald Cubitt, donated it to the Strumpshaw Steam Museum. In 2014, to mark the centenary of the outbreak of World War I, the Minenwerfer was returned to Honing and displayed outside the village hall, where it has remained to the present day. Another Minenwerfer, also dated 1917, is on display at the Campbelltown Heritage Centre in Scotland. Built in Chemnitz, Saxony, it was given to Campbelltown in 1918 and displayed in several locations over the decades. Local people knew nothing of its history, many believing it to be a Turkish naval gun until a local researcher brought the weapon's true identity and importance to the public. It was restored and unveiled once again outside the Heritage Centre in 2016. A much larger German mortar-type weapon is on display at Enniskillen in Northern Ireland. This is a 21cm Langemörser, or large mortar. The first type of this monstrous weapon entered German service in 1910 and was basically a heavy howitzer. It fired high explosive or concrete piercing shells and was built by Krupp. It weighs 7 tons and had a maximum range of around 11,000 meters or just over 12,000 yards. The Swedes kept a Mirza 16 in service until 1950. The example on display in the grounds of Enniskillen Castle commemorates Lieutenant J. A. O. Brook of the 2nd Battalion Gordon Highlanders, who was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for leading two charges on German trenches that prevented a German counterattack breaking the British line in October 1914. Standard field guns were popular as trophy memorials. At Island Dolan Castle in Scotland stands a pair of German 7.7cm field guns. The castle is the seat of the Scottish clan Macrae, and the guns form part of the clan's World War I memorial below the castle. The guns are 7.7cm FK96 field pieces, with over 5,000 built from 1905 onwards. As early war weapons, they were later found to be too light during heavy trench warfare. The guns weight just over a ton, firing a 6.8 kilo or 15 pound shell up to 8,400 meters, or just over 9,000 yards, and used high explosive, shrapnel, smoke and gas variants. Several other German field guns survive today as memorials in the UK. At Cranbrook, a village in Kent, 
The War Memorial Garden incorporates this German 10.5 cm Lightfield Howitzer 9809, which arrived in 1920. This short barrel gun weighs 1.1 tons and could lob high explosive or shrapnel shells up to 6,300 meters or almost 7,000 yards, and many were built between 1909 and 1918. In the 2010s, the gun was in a sorry state and was kindly restored for Cranbrook by 36 Engineer Regimental Workshop Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers based at Maidstone in Kent and was returned to its place of honour in the Memorial Garden in 2017, owned by the Royal British Legion. Another German 10.5 cm Lightfield howitzer is also publicly displayed, this time atop a windswept hill in Wales. After World War I, local woman Nessa Williams Vaughan arranged for the purchase of the gun from the War Office to commemorate her late brother John, who was killed serving as an officer in the South Wales Borderers on the Somme in 1916, and also to honour all local men who had been killed in action. It was delivered in 1920 and dragged by horses and men to the top of Twinagarth and cemented into place, where it has remained ever since. The only time it was removed was in 1999-2000, to 2000, when the British Army's 6th Battalion, Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, the REMI, renovated it at their workshops at Tidworth. Wales also has a trophy gun from a German U-boat, a deck gun. As well as handing over field artillery and mortars as trophies, the British government also removed them from German submarines. In Chepstow in Wales, this 10.5 cm L45 deck gun from the German submarine UB91 may be found. It was presented to the town by King George V in 1922 to recognise the bravery of local man Abel Seaman William Williams, who received a posthumous Victoria Cross during the Gallipoli landings in Turkey in 1915. UB-91 sank two ships in Welsh waters, the US Coast Guard cutter Tampa in September 1918, which resulted in 131 deaths, and the Japanese cargo ship Hirano Maru in October 1918, both kills occurring in the Bristol Channel. In 1921, the U-boat, on its way to be scrapped, visited several Welsh ports so locals could view her. The deck gun was removed and donated to Chepstow in 1922. Another U-boat deck gun is also preserved as a trophy, this time at Ward Park, Bangor in Northern Ireland. It originally belonged to German submarine UB-19. The U-boat sank several ships around the Irish coast, and after being broken up post-war, the Admiralty donated the gun to Bangor in honour of local man, Commander the Honourable Edward Bingham, who was awarded the Victoria Cross for his part in the famous 1916 Battle of Jutland. The last of the World War I trophy guns still displayed in Britain is this 7.7cm FK-16 light field gun, located in Dungannon, Northern Ireland. Major Thomas Dixon, a prominent local citizen and businessman who'd served in World War I with the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, purchased the gun at auction in 1920, and had it set up as a memorial to the men of Dungannon who had served in World War I, and in many cases had been killed. The gun is the larger barrelled version of the 7.7cm howitzer of the earlier FK-96, preserved at Island Dornund Castle, and entered service in 1916. Weighing 1.3 tonnes, it could lob various types of shell up to 10,700 metres, or nearly 12,000 yards, and updated versions would serve the German army until 1940. It uses the same gun carriage as the 10.5cm light howitzers preserved at Cranbrook and Twinagarth. You may be wondering about World War II. Did the government hand over captured Axis artillery for public display as trophies? Apparently not, perhaps recalling the local opposition and vandalism that had accompanied the first donations in 1918-22. You will find, of course, plenty of World War II-era Axis guns in museums, but the only trophy gun that I have found on free public display isn't German, it's Japanese. 
This Imperial Japanese Army 150mm field gun sits in War Memorial Park in Romsey, Hampshire. Surrendered at the end of the war in Southeast Asia, it was presented to Romsey by the former Supreme Allied Commander Southeast Asia, Admiral Viscount Mountbatten of Burma in 1946, in recognition of the townspeople's service both military and civil during World War II. Mountbatten's association with Romsey came about because his home, Broadlands, was located close by. His full title in 1946 was First Viscount Mountbatten of Burma and Baron Romsey. In 1947, he was elevated to Earl Mountbatten. The Japanese gun in Romsey is a Type 96 15cm howitzer, the type entering Japanese service in 1937. The four-ton gun had a maximum range of 11,900 metres or 13,000 yards, and the Romsey example is one of five existing in the world today out of 440 manufactured. I'd be interested to hear about any more trophy guns that may exist in the UK, but remember, a trophy gun is something which is set up in public free of charge, normally at a war memorial, and I'm not referring to museum guns or guns outside of museums, as those are generally not free of charge, and they can therefore only be visited at certain times when the museums are open. Very special thanks to those people who kindly gave up their time to go out and photograph and film many of the guns in this video. I really appreciate all of your hard work and help. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.